Good evening and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation NZ and tonight we're talking about breast conserving surgery, asking can I keep my breast? So tonight we're talking about breast conserving surgery, one of the surgical treatments offered for breast cancer and in fact it's the most common treatment in New Zealand and even more common in many other countries. So why is it most common and why might it be best for you or not? We have three speakers to help cast some light on those questions tonight. We have patient Lorna Sabritsky, surgeons Mr. Michael Patrick, and Professor Angel Arno visiting us from Canada. First, we'll hear from Lorna. <coughs> Excuse me. Many of you will know Lorna by her voice, if not by sight, from her weekday radio show on Coast FM. Lorna, thanks so much for being here tonight. Tell us about your diagnosis or in fact diagnoses of breast cancer and um, what you chose from a surgical perspective. Thanks Adele. Um, firstly I want to start with an apology um, because I'm going through chemo at the moment. Um, my immune system is very low and I've caught a bit of a pesky cold. I'm at the tail end of it but my voice is a little bit rough so trust me if you tune into coast I'm not going to sound quite this bad. Um, so breast cancer was always talked about in my family. My father's mother died at 41 of breast cancer after having had a double mastectomy. He was only 12, so obviously that had a massive impact on his life. Um, no breast cancer on my mother's side. I had a couple of cancer scares, one at 22 and one at 43. They were both suspicious looking lumps, but they were biopsied and found to be all clear. So I was kind of feeling a little bit cocky by this stage. And then a very good friend, Helena McAlpine, um, you may know her name. She was a TV personality uh, and was a tireless ambassador for the New Zealand Breast Cancer Foundation, even once she found out her breast cancer was terminal. She died at 37. And that's when I thought I really need to get myself on the register. By this stage, I was 45. Uh, so I did that. I made a promise at her funeral that I would do that, and I did. And um, that's when DCIS was discovered in my right breast. Um, grade zero, if you don't know what uh, DCIS is. Um, so very early stage. Um, I had a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy, and that was followed by radiotherapy. The margins were clear though, so there was no need for any further surgery after that um, or chemotherapy. Um, I was guided by my surgeon, um, Richard Harmon, and really uh, mastectomy wasn't something we talked about because it was such great, you know, a low-grade cancer. And um, because of issues like recovery time and aftermath, um, I just, yeah, Thought that that was the best decision to make and to be honest he did an amazing job like to this day there's a tiny little scar there and my breast feels completely normal um so i'm really 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 happy with that decision um i had yearly mammograms and ultrasounds after that for six years all clear and then i had a delayed year six checkup thanks covid um in may now two weeks before my appointment i found a lump in my left breast I'd been hospitalized earlier that year. I'd lost a bit of weight, and I think that's maybe why I could feel it so clearly, but it was a distinct lump. So I thought, oh, well, that's all right. A couple of weeks' time, I've got the, um, the mammogram and the ultrasound, and it'll be fine. It'll be just like those other lumps. It'll be biopsied and be all clear. Um, not so good during the ultrasound uh, when it was one of my lymph nodes looked a little bit dodgy, as well as this lump. And so they thought there was sort of a 25 millimeter mass in my breast um so then I went on to have surgery during which uh, they found that the tumor that was removed a grade three fairly aggressive and obviously quite quick growing tumor I uh, was 38 millimeters um, I had 18 lymph nodes removed and one of those um was cancerous as well uh, so hence me moving on to chemotherapy that will then be followed by radiotherapy um, and other treatments to follow as well when it came to considering the second time uh, whether or not to have breast concerning su uh, conserving surgery or uh, to have a mastectomy, first and foremost, um, I consider myself an expert in a whole lot of things. Um, 1950s Venetian art glass, 1980s pop songs, I'm your girl. Uh, breast cancer, not my area of expertise. So first and foremost, um, I decided to be guided by the experts, and in this case, it was Richard Harmon once again, who was again my surgeon. Um, we discussed it. Um, 
there were a whole lot of opinions given by a whole lot of people. Um, my eldest brother, um, just a bit of background, my second eldest brother died last year at 57 of bowel cancer. And so everybody's a little edgy in my family about the whole big C word. And my eldest brother goes, oh, well, you'll just be whipping them both off then, won't you? Like, just get rid of them. You don't want to know about it. And I just thought, no, no, I don't think that is necessarily the right thing for me. Now, it's not about a cosmetic thing. I mean, I really don't give a toss about my breasts. They've breast fed three children. My topless days are over. Um, they, were, they were never there, um, but they're over. Um, so it wasn't about a cosmetic thing for me. It wasn't about feeling less of a woman or anything like that. It's the fact that I understood that having a double mastectomy or even a single mastectomy is major surgery compared to a lumpectomy. So again, uh, Richard did a really neat job. And again, I don't, you know, I really don't think you could tell um, whether I had a bra on or a, a swimsuit on, that I've had any surgery at all. Um, so there is that. Um, I didn't want a long recovery. I've um, got two adult children, but I've also got a 13-year-old and I've got a brand new granddaughter as well. So I didn't want major surgery. I didn't want to be um, hospitalised for a long time and incapacitated for a long time. However, if Richard had... Uh, advise that then obviously I would have taken that path um having said all this uh because of the cancer in the family I will probably be having genetic testing and I will be I will be having genetic testing and if that shows that there is a, a genetic reason to then go ahead and have a mastectomy then um that will happen but as Richard said in that case we can plan it properly. It's not going to be a, oh, let's get everything all done at once. I can plan that and plan the reconstruction and have it done properly and actually plan the time off and the recovery time as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, the best case scenario is I've had two lumpectomies uh, with two occurrences of breast cancer. And, you know, I feel normal. I feel physically incredibly well. Um so for me, at this stage, yeah, it's been absolutely the best decision. Wow. <laughs> Lorna, that is quite a story that is, um, yeah, more than most people deal with. And, and you've dealt with that in, in a really short time. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I guess that's really highlighted just how complex these decisions and, and conversations can be. Um, we'll move on now to our next speaker, who's Mr. Mike Puttick. He is a oncoplastic breast surgeon. We're going to hear a bit more about what that actually means at Auckland City Hospital and at um, Breast Associates. Mike is going to speak to us a couple of times tonight, uh, um, just a, a quick chat up front about um, about what's on or what's on offer here as, as breast surgery, and then. Um, then we'll hear from Professor Arno, and then Mike will come back and fill us in a bit more on a local perspective at the end. So, Mike, fire away. Okay, thank you, Adela. Thank you, Lorna, because for all the technical aspects we'll be talking about tonight, it is all about people. So, <laughs> kia ora koutou. Um, just to introduce what we're trying to do here, um, surgery is really the mainstay of treatment for breast cancer. And although we do hear lots about advances in chemotherapy and um, drug treatments for cancer, we still haven't got a way around not doing an operation for people. And most of the benefit and the survival is around having a good operation. Um, happily, for what I do every day, uh, most of them are curative. And it is really a cancer that a lot can be done about and more year on year. So um, it is always, a, I think, a bombshell for people when they get a diagnosis. But um, as Lorna can testify, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, not the disaster one might think at first. I've always been a fan of history. Um, and if you look back over 100 years or more, the approaches to cancer were just to try and be as aggressive as possible. And the philosophy for surgeons and doctors, and actually sometimes driven by patients as well, was to try and do the most that their body could withstand. How much tissue could you take off? Could you take off the breast and then the lymph nodes and then some of the muscle and then a bit more and really try and fight, fight it? But what we've learned over the last century is that that is actually just way more than is necessary. And there are certain things about the biology of tumor you can influence with drug treatment. Um, and now our philosophy is really saying, well, what is the minimum treatment that is effective? And 
the history of breast cancer surgery has actually been year on year to do less and less with the same or even better and better survival. Um, so that's really what we're talking about. So in the days before breast screening was available, for example, most people who had breast cancer would be arriving in a hospital or an outpatient clinic or at their GP with a big lump that had grown maybe for some time, it wasn't talked about. Um, and then, so a mastectomy was often a logical choice. Now we're doing breast screening, people are much more breast aware. Happily, we're finding things at a much earlier stage um, with very good prognosis. And you can say to people, actually, you do not need to lose your breast. The breast conserving surgery is known as a wide excision or a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy. And it's just taking out the lump and a bit of normal tissue around it. Uh, generally, that goes along with some radiotherapy to the breast afterwards. And to some extent, there's actually a genuine choice here that the survival and outcomes uh, of having a mastectomy or a, a wide excision or a lumpectomy with radiotherapy are the same. But what we're trying to do with, with any form of cancer surgery is remove the abnormal area and get back to normal tissue all the way around it. And perhaps anyone who's had perhaps a small skin cancer will be aware of that. You take the abnormal area of skin off and then get back to normal tissue all the way around. And that's the principle that's used for basically every type of cancer in the body. It's amazing how much of the breast can actually be taken away while maintaining symmetry, uh, while maintaining the contour of the breast and the look and you know, people looking and feeling symmetrical and normal. Just want to give a little bit of a vocabulary because you may hear different words used by different people in different contexts. Breast conserving surgery is just an umbrella term for surgery that is less than a mastectomy and keeping the breast. And really we're trying to say, and really keeping a meaningful breast that you um, can dress normally in. Uh, a lot of places in New Zealand will call that a partial mastectomy. And that at first sight sounds like a huge amount, like a quarter that's been taken away. <laughs> but partial can actually be a two millimeter lump with two millimeters around it. Um, and perhaps a better term is a wide local excision. And, we'll, and the wide means you're taking a bit of normal tissue with it, not just a lump. And sometimes we do talk about a, a lumpectomy, um, which if you're a medical student, I might slap you on the wrist for, for because a lumpectomy is just removal of a lump. So really what we're talking is removal of the abnormal bit and a small rift of normal tissue around it. We're also going to talk a little bit about this concept of, of course, a therapeutic mammoplasty. Um, and that's really just taking some of the techniques that are used in normal breast reduction surgery and applying them to cancer. Uh, a, a partial mastectomy, a wide excision, is a removal of a bit of breast tissue. A breast reduction is a removal of a bit of breast tissue, usually along with some skin and reshaping the breast. And if you can combine those two areas, so the bit of tissue and skin you remove contains your cancer, you can do a therapeutic operation. That's an operation that treats the cancer and do a reduction. And uh, sometimes for people, that's even the silver lining of their diagnosis, that they actually get the reduction that they've, they've always wanted. So if we're to sort of ask the questions, why might you have one or another, or why a surgeon might uh, recommend one or another? The, the main reason really is uh, the size of the tumor relative to the size of the breast. Um, we've alluded to the fact that you can take a surprisingly large lump out of a normal sized breast and still have a good cosmetic outcome. Uh, but sometimes things are just too big to leave a meaningful amount of breast tissue behind. Um, sometimes there are other factors like if there's skin involvement at the time or um, other, other factors like that you may want to. I've said there's a genuine choice and that is certainly something that is discussed and people will have all sorts of reasons for preferring one or the other. Uh, multifocal disease historically has been a, a reason to recommend a mastectomy for people but that is not always the case as we're going to hear from Angel in a little bit. Um, but certainly I think in New Zealand, a lot of people would say that multifocal disease is perhaps a relatively strong reason to push or perhaps recommend a mastectomy over breast conserving. I've said skin involvement and perhaps if you are one of the people who have a genetic mutation or something in the family um, where there's high likelihood of developing another breast cancer uh, in the next few years or decades, then so that might be a reason to choose a mastectomy at that point. But for the majority of people who actually have what we call a sporadic, or just 
combination of bad luck getting it, uh, they're not necessarily at high risk of getting another breast cancer. And a mastectomy is more than they need. Great, thank you very much, Mike. That was really um, a good introduction to people about what we're uh, exactly what we're talking about here. Okay, so we're going to hear now from Professor Angel Arno, who's uh, come all the way from Canada in the last couple of days and um, has, is fighting jet lag to uh, to spend her time with us tonight. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Angel is a, a surgical oncologist or a, a breast cancer surgeon, as we are more likely to call them here, in the Ottawa Hospital. And in fact, is a, a professor of surgery at the University of Ottawa. She's got um, really extensive experience in breast conserving surgery and does a lot of work around quality improvement and helping to ensure best practice, um, not just for her patients, but for um, the wider Canadian um, patient group as well. So, Angel, can you fill us in with a bit of an international perspective on what's going on in breast cancer surgery and what um, patients might be thinking about when they're making decisions on breast conserving surgery. Yeah, so um, thanks so much, Adele. Uh, so just before I start my talk, um, I wanted to, to introduce myself in the sense that I'm very happy to be here. Um, the good thing is that uh, I'm here because uh, breast cancer is treated um, and breast care is delivered pretty much in the same way um, all across the world. And, um, you know, it's very exciting for me to see uh, the slight differences in the types of patients in, in slight differences in the way we practice. But breast cancer compared to other cancers has uh, very, very, is very, very strongly evidence-based. And that means that there are lots and lots of good research uh, as compared to other cancers, it is the most researched uh, type of cancer with the best outcomes as a result. Um, it is the cancer where you can get the most number of people cured. It is the cancer that has the best prognosis compared to other cancers. And it is also the one with the most amount of guidelines um, in terms of how we practice. And so I'm very happy uh, to be here to be able to discuss some of the same um, issues that we face in Canada. Uh, with you today. And my patients are experiencing pretty much what I hear from Lorna here as well, um, with the same thoughts and same concerns and same considerations when it comes to deciding the type of surgery. So today, I just wanted to share with you um, what's the latest evidence on uh, saving the breast when you have a breast cancer, um, and what are the different newer techniques that we are looking at to try and save somebody's breast. Um, the reason is, uh, and I don't have any conflict of interest, it's important for us to understand that the whole world is moving towards um, breast conserving surgery as opposed to mastectomy as the preferred option uh, for uh, breast cancer treatment. Uh, shown here are the mastectomy rates um, across the world uh, trending downwards over the US, UK, and Canada, and I think also in New Zealand as well. And the reason why that is the case um, is because it is very clear now we have 30 years of data. Um, that's a really long time showing that people are not worse off if they have their breasts saved, um, that a mastectomy is not better in terms of never seeing a cancer again and in terms of how long you live. And, and that's been proven over and over again. So now the emphasis is on trying to um, make sure the patient um, feels good, um, heals fast, and recovers from this highly curable disease in most cases um, as quickly as possible to get on back onto their normal life. And part of that is feeling good about yourself and not having a surgery that takes so long to recover from or causes you significant uh, pain or other consequences afterwards. The guidelines, uh, these are international guidelines. Um, are now emphasizing that when we do save the breast, that we focus on using certain techniques. These techniques are called oncoplastic techniques to really maintain the shape of the breast and, and the cosmetic look of the breast, but at the same time, take a huge amount of tissue out to make sure that this thing never comes back. So what is oncoplastic surgery? It is really just um, maintaining the uh, shape of the breast and uh, maybe even improving the cosmetic outcome of the breast after the surgery 
but at the same time, not sacrificing any of the cancer surgery principles, which as Dr. Puttick mentioned earlier, involves complete removal of a tumor, making sure you get a little extra around the tumor to make sure you got it all, um, and that's called the margin, to make sure that the breast is immediately reshaped after uh, the excision of the tumor and a little bit of extra tissue. Uh, and sometimes this involves also reshaping the other side to make sure we achieve symmetry. But the overall goal, as I mentioned, is to leave the patient looking the same and often actually looking better. So this is an example of a patient with a fairly large tumor, three centimeters, and is taken out from her left breast. You can see that with some reshaping um, and recentralizing of the nipple, that you don't actually see a deformity and the scar will fade with time um, and the patient won't, it won't be visible that she had um, some kind of surgery there. This is a patient where you're actually looking, she's actually looking better after the surgery. And you can see on the uh, left side of your screen that before uh, shot, she has a tumor down there at 2.3 centimeters on the inner aspect of her breast. And although you can't see, there's another tumor on the outer aspect of her uh, right breast. And she had them both removed through one uh, partial mastectomy and it gave her a breast lift um, at the same time which um, she also wouldn't mind, have minded having the other side done as well. And so this is an oncoplastic surgery procedure. As surgeons, we've really come a long way in terms of how we operate. Um, and the main thing is to take out, the ability to take out a large amount of tissue um, with a cancer in the middle of it um, and making sure that the patient uh, has a nice result afterwards. I'm gonna, emphasize a little bit about the issues with a mastectomy. Yes, there are many cases where uh, that we cannot control, where the tumor is too large, um, or if the patient has a gene mutation, meaning that we shouldn't save the breast because they have a high risk of recurrence. But those cases are not that common. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the majority of cases, um, uh, cancers are very small, they're screen detected. The average cancer size is between one to two centimeters. And so um, there really is no reason to have a mastectomy. And why we care so much about saving your breast is because there are some issues that people don't realize um, that can come up after they have a mastectomy that can really interfere with the quality of life. And it's been shown over and over again that about 90% of women who've had a mastectomy have some kind of negative consequence related to their quality of life due to the mastectomy itself. For example, it's been shown uh, that on a variety of domains, having the breast removed is not just about loss of femininity or something um, uh, along those lines, but really does actually interfere with more than just body image, relates to interference with uh, decrease, two times decreased sexual functioning, twice the amount of anxiety, three times the amount of depression, and what's very interesting and uh, sad for me is that people with mastectomy think they have a, a worse prognosis than people with breast conserving surgery. So for some reason, having the breast gone and a big scar there reminding you every day when you're showering is giving you the sense that you're actually not having as great a prognosis as you, as you are actually in reality. And so there are a lot of emotional uh, consequences to this that could interfere with your quality of life, which also means that you're less likely to go out and enjoy life, which means you're less likely to exercise or eat well and do all those healthy things. And that may actually contribute to um, a shorter lifespan. In terms of affecting you and how you move and how you function, there's over half the women have some level of recorded upper body impairment sometimes lasting as long as seven years. People uh, note that there's a difference in the way they move and their tilt and the alignment of their shoulders. They lose their strength, um, which is important if, for example, you are doing uh, any upper body exercises or, or sports or, or things like rowing or biking or skiing. It'll become very noticeable. People talk about imbalance and um, this is important about half the women 
realize that they actually may not want to go back to work or have some co concerns about continuing their work. So it really does affect you on the mental, but also on the physical level. There's also post mastectomy pain syndrome. People feel tightness. People feel some pain, even when uh, a sensation of a breast, even when the breast is not there. That's called the phantom breast syndrome. And you can get swelling of not only the arm, which is called lymphedema, but also a decreased blood flow in your chest wall, which can create some skin changes and swelling as well. So all of these things need to be considered when a patient is deciding about having a mastectomy. And especially the fact that I mentioned there really is no evidence that it's actually now better than a, lump, uh, a lumpectomy or breast conserving surgery. So I just wanna go through very quickly, if you're considering about mastectomy and the fact that you, know, you do have a choice most of the time, there are a lot of myths people think um, about their situation that require them to have a mastectomy that are really just myths. The first is that if you've got disease in more than one part of your breast, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need a mastectomy. Often it is the case um, that patients think that way uh, if you have disease in multiple parts of the breast. I'm here showing you one of my patients where she had disease in all those highlighted areas. And it was seemed like it was quite extensive. She thought she needed a mastectomy. But as I mentioned, with special techniques called oncoplastic surgery, we can actually remove that exact shape of tissue from her breast and give her a little bit of a lift and do the same thing on the other side. And that is a classic on the plastic technique that we stole from plastic surgeons. And this is what she was before surgery. This is what she is after uh, radiation and one month after surgery. And then this is what she is five years after surgery. She regrets nothing. She's the happiest patient um, amongst my patients. All these patients who have the ability to save their breasts and look better uh, compared to before uh, while at the same time getting rid of all the tumor and having the best chance of never seeing the skin are the most happy patients. If a tumor is in the central part of your breast and is involving the nipple, it doesn't always mean a mastectomy is required either. So here's a patient with a tumor right underneath the nipple and actually a second one just below. And it was very close to the nipple to the point where you need to remove the nipple. This is the outline of the piece that I had to take out during surgery connecting the two cancers. And this is what she looks like afterwards. It's true, she doesn't have a nipple on that side, but in my opinion, she still looks a whole lot better than a mastectomy. And she can fill her bra. She doesn't have to change her wardrobe. She doesn't have to have reconstruction. Nobody can tell anything by if she wore a bra at, or from wearing clothing on the outside. And she's very happy because she has still, still has at least some sensation and a breast mount. So these are examples of people who've had bilateral reductions. Um, one side had cancer and the other side was done to match. And these, this may be an option sometimes, especially if the lady is elderly, um, to try and reduce the size and improve the shape of the breast. The third myth is if the tumor is too big, um, then you need to have a mastectomy. Well, we've come a long way in terms of how we treat breast cancer. There is now the option of what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy prior to surgery. Remember, if you're being offered this uh, chemotherapy prior to surgery, it's only because you are going to get it after surgery anyway. So it's really offered to patients with aggressive disease. There are two types of aggressive disease cancers. They are called triple negative and HER2 positive breast cancer subtypes. If you have these subtypes, you will be offered chemotherapy as part of your treatment plan. And why not put that chemotherapy before surgery because it can not only shrink the cancer, but also um, allow the cancer to be smaller so that your surgeon doesn't have to remove as much. And so if you're thinking about potentially um, being eligible for breast conserving surgery, uh, but you have a big tumor, uh, your surgeon may, may be discussing with you uh, the use of chemotherapy prior to surgery as a method to uh, shrink the cancer and perform uh, breast conserving surgery. Um, the other myth is that the patient is not eligible for radiation and so a mastectomy must be done. So oftentimes when we do uh, breast conserving surgery, it must be followed by radiation, which is shining x-rays on the remaining breast tissue 
after the surgery is done to prevent a cancer from coming back. And often patients say, well, I don't want radiation because I have this disease or I have um, this problem. These are the usual um, uh, ineligibility criteria for radiation. But remember, they're uh, relative ineligibility criteria, meaning that it doesn't mean that if you've had radiation previously or if you have any of these psoriasis, lupus, or scleroderma, skin diseases that you can't have radiation. It's important also to understand that as we've come a long way in terms of how we treat breast cancers, we now have more medications targeting cancers and the outcomes are much better. Maybe you can avoid radiation altogether. So the final myth is that when a patient comes to me and they say, you know what, I've already thought about it. Uh, I've talked to all of my friends and family. I don't wanna hear anything other than the fact that you're gonna offer me a mastectomy. But for me, I just wanna make sure, um, as I mentioned, all of those consequences discussed earlier, that, that the patient is aware of all of that. I think every patient needs to fully understand all of the things I'm talking about on this slide which is that when you have a mastectomy, it is number one, not better for you in terms of recurrence. It doesn't prevent you from requiring chemotherapy if your tumor dictates it. So just because you have a mastectomy doesn't mean that you don't need chemotherapy if your tumor is aggressive. It also means that the patient should realize that you have twice the surgical complications with a mastectomy, at least two times uh, long in terms of how long you recover. Breast conserving surgery, people recover about a week to 10 days. Mastectomy, people recover four to six weeks. And if you add reconstruction, it's another four weeks after that. So eight to 12 weeks with immediate reconstruction in terms of recovery. People with reconstruction also um, are not often limited to just one surgery. They're gonna have multiple revision surgeries after that. So the patient has to understand that they're leading, uh, getting themselves into a long road of surgeries if they go through mastectomy and reconstruction. And that may be an option, but may not be the best option. They also must realize that there are functional, cosmetic, and emotional consequences of a mastectomy. And mammograms are not routinely offered um, after a mastectomy either. So detection of recurrence would be by feel um, or visually. So it's important that patients don't make rush decisions. Also, people can realize that you don't need to decide on, on the, the surgery in terms of if you want a mastectomy, you can always have it later. Um, I tell my patients, if you're not sure and if you're scared, um, maybe we should do the breast conserving surgery first, and then you can always come back for a mastectomy if you feel that that really is the wrong thing, uh, that it really is the right thing for you. I will tell you from experience that the majority of women that do that um, end up being satisfied with breast conserving surgery. Okay, so something's going on with the. All right, so that's pretty much the end of my talk. I hope um, that answers a lot of your questions and concerns, and I'm happy to take any other questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Angel. That was um, I, I learned a lot tonight about um, about mastectomies and, and breast conserving mm -hmm. surgery. So that's um, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, we'll flip back to Mike now with some okay. some follow up local input. Thank you. Well, I was just going to oh, say thank you again to Angel for all of that, um, and I think that really covers it. And really, just perhaps just touch on to the New Zealand context and what's available in this country and perhaps ask the question, well, why, why wouldn't people have breast conserving surgery? And I think there are a number of reasons. And one of the reasons is that um, we are a very geographically dispersed country and access to radiotherapy is one of those things. Um, I've talked about uh, how things have changed surgically over the last century, but even over the last decade or so, radiotherapy has made some big leaps. I think about 10 years ago, standard course of radiotherapy after breast cancer was removed would have been about five weeks long. Um, trials have then come out to show that you can give the same dose of radiotherapy over three weeks. Um, and now the standard that is coming out is that you can give a similar dose just in five days. Uh, so the doses and the treatment is the same, but you can actually give it more uh, rapidly. Um, and certainly I think for people who do have to travel 
for example, people travelled out from Northland down to Auckland to have radiotherapy. And being away for one week is a very different entity uh, to being away mm -hmm. for three weeks. So I'm hoping that, that those advances and um, uh, you know, the radiation oncologist being at the cutting edge of what's going on is actually really going to improve people's access to that. Um, there is a fear of recurrence. And I think we've touched on the fact that the survival having a breast conserving option is the same. Um, there is still some breast tissue. But with good surgery and radiotherapy, the recurrence rate is exceedingly low, in the order of maybe 2 to 5%. That's 95% or more people never having a recurrence in the breast, if you flip that on its head. Um, and I know it is an issue for some people, and they get some anxiety around coming for their mammograms and their checks. Um, most people I see, that does get easier with time. Uh, but it is a, a, some, something to discuss and th think about. Lorna's has talked about all the helpful advice from very well-meaning friends. Um, and there will be people who, and, and sometimes the, uh, I see ladies that their knee-jerk response is, I take them both off. I don't want them. And I'd really, really um, second what Angel said about taking some time, you know, up front, do what you have to, and then think about the, what you could do later on. And, um, you know, as, as surgeons and, and all doctors treating people, we want a good cancer outcome, but we also want, you to be able to look back in 10, 20 years' time and be able to look back and go, I made good decisions based on the information I had. I didn't rush into something. Um, and I think psychologically, we always want to have um, our treatment done tomorrow. But actually, for almost all breast cancers, you know, a couple of weeks of thinking about things, planning it, um, doesn't make any difference to the outcome, but will certainly make difference to your own psychological health and um, uh, you know, it may help you make good decisions. There is a genuine thing of needing more than one operation. You're trying to remove the abnormal bit, get normal tissue all the way around it. And um, nationally, up to one in five people will sometimes need a second operation. Um, just hearing about the side effects and the consequences of having a mastectomy, yes, it is a second operation, but it is a very minor operation. And the recovery of getting yourself back to normal, I would say, would still be quicker than if you'd have a mastectomy and fewer long-term problems. Um, and then the other, you know, you, you, people will be advised by their surgeon and different surgeons will have different preferences. Um, I think the education for breast surgeons in this country is very good. Um, more and more people are being trained. It's now standard to be trained in the oncoplastic techniques. So people will feel more comfortable taking bigger lumps out in a breast conserving operation. Um, and then access to reconstruction sometimes affects people that it's easier to get a, an immediate breast reconstruction if you have a mastectomy in a main centre than if you live out of it. So those are really just the, the issues that, that people are facing because um, we live in a very uh, dispersed country um, and some people do have to travel for care. And if I was to say one thing I'd want is to really boost the equity of access for everybody, um, that we could all get access to the best treatment. Um, and all, all options available to all people in a timely way. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, that gives us a really good local perspective. Um, we're going to open up to questions now. So um, first up, a question about um, uh, what if you've got really small breasts um, and, you've, and your lump is quite big in your breast? Does that make a difference to what you can have? Um, Maybe, um, Angel, maybe we'll flip back to you on that one. Sure. Um, yeah, so as um, uh, Dr. Paddock mentioned earlier, it's the, it's the ratio between the size of the tumor and the size of your breast. Um, that is a meaningful ratio in terms of whether or not you're eligible for breast conserving surgery. And uh, so if it really is not a good ratio, Usually we say if the tumor is more than uh, a quarter of your breast, for example, or, or almost a quarter of your breast, then, you know, uh, probably um, there needs to be either special techniques such as oncoplastic surgery, which generally is limited to larger breasts, um, or uh, you need to see if you're, uh, if you actually do you know, need chemo post-surgery, in which case you can have it before and shrink the tumor and then allow yourself to have breast conserving surgery. If those two options are, are not available, then, then perhaps um, you can uh, discuss 
uh, a mastectomy, I think your surgeon would likely recommend a mastectomy if there really is no other option. Unfortunately, oncoplastic surgery and the special techniques that we talked about, as you saw from the pictures, um, it generally involves reshaping if you have some additional breast to reshape with. Um, and so small breasts, uh, extremely small breasts, for example, would not, it would not benefit from that. So if you are looking at mastectomy, uh, uh, then, you know, there is, as mentioned earlier, potentially the option of reconstruction and saving your nipple as well, um, if, that, if that is something that you think you might be interested in. Great, great. Um, now, um... Mike, one for you here on the subject of the of going back. I, I have to go back for more surgery. Should I now switch to a mastectomy? Is that is that what people do? Do they, do they keep having more um, breast taken out? Will they switch to mastectomy? But the, the standard would be that um, all results are looked at at what we call a multidisciplinary meeting. So every week or two, I'm sitting down with the radiologists and the pathologists and actually looking at everyone's pathology in detail. So we're looking for abnormal bit out and a good margin around. And sometimes it's close. So actually all you need to do is just take a little bit more tissue. Um, and in those cases, I'd be saying no. Other times there's actually an involved margin. So perhaps more than is showing up on the scans. And that's why we do sit and discuss these things and look. Um, there'll also be some factors coming in saying, well, actually, if we've done a relatively small resection for the size of the breast, then we can easily take more and safely take more. If we're already at the limit of what we can do, it may still be possible, but it's harder. So I think that's an individualized um, dec decision. It's an individualized conversation. But I would say actually the majority of people who I need to see to say you need a bit more tissue taken, we can keep sticking with breast conserving surgery. By the time if it comes to a third resection and there's still involved disease or disease left behind, then you might move to that. Um, but again, there, there's still choice. People choose. And I've certainly had people who've gone, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take a third choice and we've got it a third time. Uh, and still kept abreast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Lorna, did that happen to you at all? Did you have to go back for more? No, no, no. It was all cleanly, luckily, cleanly done um, first time round. Nice, yep. nice. Okay, great. Um, now, with a, um, another question here, it's quite a complex one actually with a few different elements to it, so I might just split it up a bit. Um, just um, a sort of, a, I guess, a philosophical question asking about the financial viability of oncoplastic surgery with our tight New Zealand healthcare budgets. I don't think that's been asked by the Ministry of Health, but, uh, but maybe. Um, yeah, is oncoplastic surgery expensive? Do you know, Mike? Or is it the same as the cost? It's a bit more time consuming. Um, so, in, yes, it than, than, a bit, straight. Than, than, a, than a straight partial mastectomy or right. a straight mastectomy. Right, yeah. Um, it's so that is an upfront thing basically in theatre time. Um, in terms, I mean, we've alluded to the fact that perhaps you do get a wider excision if you're taking, you can be more generous with your reception. Mm -hmm. So, actually, the chance of needing to take more uh, is, is lower. Um, and What's actually harder to quantify or put a, a financial value on is the, the morbidity and the suffering and problems that go on for following a mastectomy and people needing you know, physiotherapy and shoulder problems. Mm. So uh, the headline is it takes more theatre time, so therefore more expensive from that. But actually, the, once you're in theatre, apart from the minutes, it's not more expensive to do. Yeah. That be your, no, your I 100% I agree. And, uh, you know, I think I, you know, if this is a patient asking for it, really asking the question, the, the focus should be on what gives you the better outcome, not um, what is financially, you know, acceptable to the to the healthcare system. It is cheaper than having a mastectomy with reconstruction, that's for sure, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, if that's the right thing for you, because that is evidence-based and that is guideline-based, then, then that's what you need to have. And another analogy might be, say, um, another cancer field of, of, of bowel cancer. A lot of people would as standard be having a keyhole operation or a laparoscopic operation. That actually involves more expensive equipment and takes longer in theater, but it's getting people back to work quicker and a better quality of life and fewer complications. So it's it's more where where in the budget it goes, um, but 
we treat people, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and most advances in healthcare do involve some upfront costs, but it involve, but it also the outcome is that you have a better quality of life, better outcomes and better health for people. Right. Okay, and now um, just a question uh, about the neoadjuvant chemo um, and surgery, Angel. So that's for having the, when you have your chemo before your surgery. How soon after the chemo should you have the surgery? That's the question. Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, generally, you know, chemo is fairly hard hitting to your immune system. And so um, we would like you to recover for that from that before surgery. And usually it's a period of four to six weeks um, that we normally would consider uh, doing the operation after chemo. There's actually been some studies that have shown that you have less chance of getting an infection from the surgery if you have your surgery during that period. Uh, there's a higher chance if you have it before that period and even a higher chance if you wait too long. So. So four to six weeks seems to be the sweet spot um, after the last dose of chemo. Great, thank you. Um, now someone's just popped in a question to ask, um, is oncoplastic surgery not funded? Yes, oncoplastic surgery is funded in New Zealand. That is our standard yes, option in the, yeah. in the public health sector. Right, um, okay. Now a question about... Um, 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 Slightly off topic, someone with a, um, a BRCA gene mutation asks, um, saying she has had one breast removed, uh, and perhaps this is a, a topic that Lorne is also interested in, would it be wise to get the other breast removed? Um, uh, maybe Angel can start on that. Sure, uh, feel free to chime in. But generally, um, we say that um, a patient with a BRCA mutation, um, you know, depending on if you've I don't remember if you've already had the cancer or your um, prophylactic. Um, say she's had breast cancer. Yeah. yeah. So and it's BRCA two, right? So we usually quote a forty to sixty percent uh, contralateral risk of of cancer on the other side, basically. And so, generally speaking, um, that's too high a risk. Uh, for for most people, and definitely for clinicians to accept uh, you keeping the contralateral breast or the opposite breast, um, and there really isn't anything else other than surgery um, that can reduce that risk in a meaningful way. You can take uh, uh, medications like tamoxifen or endocrine therapy or hormonal therapy that can cut that down risk down by half. Um, but still, at the end of the day, it is a 20 to 30 percent um, risk of cancer on the other side. Um, if you take the medication, if you don't, it's 40 to 60. So in both ways, often people uh, feel that that risk is too high. And we would, as clinicians, would recommend um, the other breast being removed. Would you agree? Yes. And certainly that option would be off offered as well. Um, a few people in that scenario will say, well, I'm not quite ready for that. Um, I've got a few ladies who've actually gone along to actually just explore it to see how far down that path they might want to go now. So they've actually gone and had consultations with plastic surgeons to see what their reconstruction options are. Um, and sometimes they've said, pause, I won't want to go now. And they'll keep on with high-risk surveillance. But also if they're on the high-risk surveillance pathway, actually having the conversation say, well, what are you going to do if something is found? And at that point, they might say, oh, there's something here, or they have a couple of scares, or there's a, something seen on an ultrasound, they have a benign biopsy, and then they say, I'm fed up now, I don't want to do this. Um, and they can press the go button, and they're already sort of in the system. Um, in our unit, we have a health psychologist who's very helpful just, just to talk people through it. And um, she can sometimes introduce some people who've been, who've been through it as well. So it's an individual decision, um, but it's certainly on offer. That's great. And that's a good reminder, Mike. Um, not not all DHBs or perhaps sometimes uh, access to that kind of counselling isn't as available for everybody. So do contact Breast Cancer Foundation. We do fund free counselling on um, people facing those questions as well. Just get in touch with our nurses and we'll tell you how to do that a bit later. Um, a question about um, young women. Uh, is it true that young women should have uh, a mastectomy because their cancer is more aggressive? Angel, could you... Yeah, I think, you know, definitely in the last decade, I think things have changed dramatically. It used to be that um, young women are probably more uh, recommended to have a mastectomy because 
not so much because the cancer is aggressive, because we have treatment for aggressive cancer that's in the form of chemotherapy and targeted agents or medications um, that targets the aggressiveness. So young women having mastectomy used to be recommended because of the fact that um, young women probably are at higher chance of having a gene mutation when, um, as a reason to have a breast cancer uh, and therefore uh, would have a higher chance of recurrence because of the gene mutation and gene, uh, gene uh, testing, genetic testing wasn't as uh, widespread as it is now. And so there was a thought that maybe some young women with breast cancer have the gene but wasn't found on testing or, or didn't get the proper test or didn't have access to the test and therefore they should have a mastectomy. The other reason um, in the past was there was a concern about giving radiation to young women um, after breast conserving surgery because it was thought that it may increase the risk of a different kind of cancer in the, in the breast and the skin in the future. So those um, concerns are, have now been uh, shown to not really actually be uh, 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 barriers uh, to breast conserving surgery. Um, these days, uh, young women coming through with breast cancer would probably undergo uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, would definitely get genetic um, testing to make sure they don't have a gene mutation. And at the end of the day, if they don't have a gene mutation and their tumor is eligible for breast conservation and they're interested in saving their breasts, um, then yes, we would offer uh, breast conserving surgery, um, at least in, in North America. And you'd expect that to have the same um, survival rate? Absolutely. Already. We would only offer something if we, so, so this is very important, I think. Um, you know, as, as physicians and as clinicians, when we offer something, a uh, choice uh, of a procedure or a treatment or, or something to a patient, it means we're of the understanding based on our literature and our scientific evidence that it has equivalent outcome to the other option. We would never offer you a choice or a procedure if it's an inferior option, unless you specifically refused the recommended option. So that's important for people to understand. So when we give people a choice, it means in our head, we think that there's equivalent um, outcomes. And it's really, because there's equivalent outcomes, it's your choice. Okay, um, just got a few minutes left and a couple more questions. Uh, so here's um, someone who had a five centimeter lobular cancer, and she's saying she had a, um, a lumpectomy, but there, there weren't clear margins, so they talked about um, trying again to, to get um, a bit more of the tumor out, get some clear margins, but instead this lady had a mastectomy. She's saying... Um, well, that was recommended and that's what she did. Would you have explored a second attempt? <laughs> it's a tricky question when you, when you haven't seen the, the patient or the, the tumor, but uh, yeah. Or is lobular cancer different? Is the other question. I would say no, the, the principles would be the same. And mm -hmm. we, I think I sort of said earlier, we discuss it in a meeting and look at it. Um, I think when you're the operating surgeon, you have a feel if you're right up at the limit of what you can do in breast conserving options, um, whether there's an option of turning something into those therapeutic mammoplasties. So really, I suppose a, a simple excision is where you can just remove the breast tissue and keep all of the skin envelope and move some tissue around to keep the breast shape. The, 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 the oncoplastic or the therapeutic mammoplasties actually do need to take some skin, reduce the skin envelope to preserve the breast shape. And it's really what the options are around that. Um, so hard, hard, to, hard to say in the abstract, but... Um, it's not a, it's not a straight to mistake. No, I 100% agree. So, um, you know, I think maybe the the concern here um, is that lobular cancers can be more hidden um, on traditional imaging like mammograms, and so um, it's one of the indications uh, for use of preoperative breast MRI, which is not routinely used for all breast cancer cases, but is an indication potentially to be used for a lobular breast cancer. And that is to, to uh, be able to see the full extent of disease more clearly than a mammogram uh, could see for lobular breast cancers. Um, and, you know, I think I, I would agree with you 100% is that, um, you know, if you did do the surgery, if the surgeon did do the surgery and found a positive margin, uh, I, I, my opinion is always, you know, 
if there is breast tissue left, um, try and do a re-excision. The thing that most people don't realize is that 70% of re-excisions um, actually are clear, either because your new margin is clear or because there actually is no additional disease. Um, in fact, most of the time we don't find additional disease. And so 70% of the time the re-excision is actually successful. And re-excisions are, are uncommon to begin with, but a second re-excision is even more uncommon and even more successful. So uh, I would always attempt another re-excision before converting to a mastectomy. And as mentioned earlier, the re-excision could be the form of just taking a slight slice of tissue extra or converting it to a, a reduction if you still have a, a good size breast left. Great, thank you. Um, and is, can you get a nipple reconstruction if you are having breast conserving surgery? So like those photos you showed us, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely have a nipple reconstruction in Canada. It is offered by the plastic surgeon under local anesthetic. So you don't, don't actually have to go to sleep um, they arrange for a tattoo artist to, to do a little um, 3D tattoo of the area. And then um, after uh, that's set and done, the plastic surgeon will um, twist it up into a, a new nipple. And, um, and so it's a fairly quick procedure. In Canada, it's, it's private though. Um, you'd have to pay as a patient. Um, but the rest of our public, our, our healthcare system is completely public. So um, Maybe that's a little bit different here. I don't know. You can get a nipple reconstruction in the public system. There we tend to do it that if you're going to have a little, give it some projection, you do that little skin flap, skin mm -hmm. rotation first, and then get it tattooed afterwards. But it oh, is see. available through the public system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're just about out of time. Just one last question. Um, Breast Cancer Foundation put out a report that said that survival is actually better for breast conserving surgery, or it appears to be. What's your thought on that, Angel, and the international? Yeah. So, so first of all, it's at least as good. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that it is um, some studies coming out showing that it's actually better. And it relates to some of the things I was mentioning earlier about the quality of life. And so, um, you know, when, when we talk about getting better quality of life, what does that mean? Well, there are things that people do when they feel better about themselves um, and have the ability to go out and exercise and feel good about themselves and eat well. These are all things in addition to the surgery and the cancer treatment, the chemo and all that. Those are exercise, keeping your a proper weight, eating well, um, feeling good about yourselves have all been shown to actually be beneficial in terms of cancer outcome as well. And so indirectly, saving your breast is allowing you to do more of those good things, which can make your outcomes better. The other thing is our ability to um, get uh, clear margins, to do pathology assessments, the way we do breast conservation has really changed remarkably over the last few years. Um, in some cases, we can get even wider margins um, compared to mastectomy, in some cases with oncoplastic surgery. And so um, I think it's important that people understand that the, the breast conserving surgery is no longer, no longer inferior. Um, and in many cases, it's better because of the, the other effects I mentioned. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much to our speakers, Lorna, Mike, and Angel. You've been really fantastic tonight.